It's all about the rules. If you play by specific rules, you can get something done. Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 720. My guest today, Hanchi Jerry Piddington. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. It's a place to find out all the stuff that we're doing, the stuff we work on. It's also the easiest place to find our products. Yeah, we make and sell stuff. And the code PODCAST15 is going to save you 15% on the stuff that you find over on that store. Now, the show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. show comes out twice a week, has for many years. And why do we do it? Well, our goal here at Whistlekick is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You could make a purchase, maybe share an episode like this one, post it on your social media, tell other people about it, or you could join our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlecake is a place we post exclusive content, and you can get access to at least some of it for as little as $2 a month. The more you're willing to throw our way, the more we're going to throw back your way. And if you ever want the full list of all the ways you can help, as well as a constantly rotating mix of behind the scenes and other fun stuff, check out whistlekick.com slash family. So today's guest, if you know his name, you know everything I'm about to say. But if you don't know Hanchi Jerry Piddington, you may not know that this is a man who's been around, who has had the opportunity to not only train with and connect with, but compete with, and in many cases defeat, some of the absolute greatest martial artists that we've ever not only had on the show, but talked about on the show. This is a man who is threaded into the history of modern martial arts. And I had so much fun talking to him. What a fun guy. He's the best, seriously. And I can't imagine you're not going to enjoy this episode. There was laughter. There was great storytelling. And I just, I just think it was the best. So here we go. Anchi Piddington, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. All right. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Of course. I'm glad you're here. You know, you've been doing this for a little while and you've met and connected with and trained with and competed with. You know, if if we were to make a list, it would probably be easier to say who you hadn't because it's a long list. But the I find the longer I spend training and doing this show, for me, it comes back to why. Not not what, not who, not when. But why? And that's where I'd like to start today. Why do you continue to involve yourself in the martial arts? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. Absolutely. I think, I, I, you know, I think that, I think that, that uh, we're all on a journey. We all have our own journey. And we select that journey by virtue of our decision that we make along the way. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of important to, to, to see what you're receiving back by virtue of what you're doing and the decision making that you're, that you're doing. If you're getting something back for your endeavor, for your journey, then it's easier to move forward because you're receiving the benefit of your own journey. Uh, the explanation that is uh, pat yourself on the back, uh, enjoy what you do, uh, know yourself, help others, and serve others, and you're in good shape. And that that by itself lets you move forward and continue your journey. So if we take that and we we kind of look at your life in martial arts in reverse, when were you aware of that investment starting to pay off? It doesn't. I mean, so, some might argue it pays off day one. I, I think most people would say it takes at least a little bit of time. When were you first aware that that investment was paying some dividends for you? Uh, I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, I, I was studying uh, this, this, uh, a Japanese style of karate or participating uh, in a Shotokan class in Long Beach, California. And uh, I continued that training there for 
a couple of years and then our family moved other to another place and uh, uh, I continued my uh, training in boxing with guys like Joe Orbeo and Jerry Corey and those guys in uh, Southern California. And then uh, uh, we moved. I got married and I continued my studies in Orange County, California. Um, I studied with uh, Robert A. Trias, the man who founded karate in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, I trained with Mike Stone, who was Priscilla Presley's uh, second husband, I guess I guess they would call it. Mike was a Hawaiian boy. His teacher was Herbert Peters. And I ran his uh, Los Alamitas school for a while. And I had a teacher also named Tom Kreitz, who was in the same family as the USKA, Robert Trias. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hulon Willis, I worked with him for a while. Chris Armstrong, I worked with him for a while. Um, I had st- I had teachers in different styles uh, because I was a very f- a firm believer that not any one style was the right style and not any one style was the correct style to train in. That was pretty uh, uncommon back then, though, wasn't it? Very. So where where did that bucking of the trend come in? Because you must have, must have caught some grief from others for well, doing so. Well, back in the late, in the 60s, uh, middle 60s, there was uh, Chuck Norris had a school in Torrance, California on El Prado mm-hmm. Street. Uh, Mike Stone had his school over in Los Alamitos. Phil Perales had a good school over there. Uh, Bruce Lee was training in uh, San, San Fernando Valley. Uh, uh, I had a small school in Anaheim, California. And Benny, the Jet, Eurekitas, and that family had some schools there in the, in the valley. Mm-hmm. And we would all get together on a Wednesday night of a certain week and fight each other and have fun and trade material. And, and uh, so there was representative of different styles at that time. And uh, all the way from the Kung Fu, from the Wing Chun, uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce's style. Also, Al Dacascos was there, too. Oh, yeah. So those styles were all mixing for fighting on Wednesday or Thursday night at somebody's school. There was nobody famous yet. And uh, uh, so I got it in my mind then that I was not going to stay with one specific style. So I started to create what is called the American Open Style. And I worked with that. I went back east. I was one of the first fighters to travel from the West Coast to the East Coast and actually live in the East. Went to Baltimore, Maryland, um, Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and taught there for many years. Uh, but you know, while I was in Richmond, uh, Mr. Robert Trias asked me, he goes, Jerry, he says, well, well, we want to do our rank certifications, but we don't know which system of study you got. Because I had studied the Shore I with him, mm-hmm. the Shore and Rue with Mike Stone and the Kempo, and the Shotokan with Kayla Adkins and uh, the Goju with Chris Armstrong. So I just said, Mr. Trias, it's American karate. Mm-hmm. And that was in 1970. What did he think of that? Was he okay with that? Yeah, well, uh, uh, to authorize rank, you gotta you gotta give me a manual. You gotta show me what you what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So I worked for two years and put it all on paper, and I sent it to him, and he sent me a a charter for American Open Style Karate. Mm-hmm. And ever since then, I have a blanket with that organization, and uh, his successor was John Pachivas in Florida. And uh, Mr. Jetting knows him well. Uh, and he gave me a charter for the Shorai Shorinru Karate Do. So I have two charters, uh, one for American Open Style Karate and one for the Shorai and the Shorinru. And that took many years, many, many years. Uh, so I have 14 schools right now that are, are all part of that American Open Blanket. And some of them have created their own styles, their own systems of study, uh, because uh, it's, it is all American now. There's, mm. there's no pure purists out there anymore. Not even in Okinawa or Japan are there purists anymore. Mm. And I, I agree with you. I suspect some, some might disagree. I think, I think there are people who don't understand the concept of influence. 
Well, you, you, they, at they're they're locked into the to the to the thought that this is a traditional art, and really it's already evolved way past traditional. I've been teaching the same material in my style for over forty years, and the rule of thumb in all arts are if you teach something for thirty years, it is traditional. At the end of the third mm. decade, it becomes traditional. So uh, that's where I come from on that thought. There is no pure form of martial art. So if if there's no if there's no pure traditional, no real old traditional, what are your thoughts on people getting worked up in discussions on that subject? Oh, I think that's a really good subject. I mean, if you go to New York City and you watch a guy do, uh, let's say, let's say he does a, a standard kata, like uh, we'll say basai, hmm. that's in every system. Okay, you, it won't be the same in LA as it is in New York. Right. It won't be the same as in Dallas, Texas, as it is in in Flint, Michigan. It sure. won't be the same. There'll be different movements. You can get a, a, a grandmaster from uh, from Okinawa over here and and do a short in rukata. And then uh, another grandmaster from the, the uh, from the city of Naha or Tamari Te in Okinawa, and have them both come over here, and they're going to be doing it different also. So kata is pre-described movement in application of self-defense. Mm-hmm. There are bunkai or the understanding of the kata. What are you What are you doing when you perform your kata? What are you doing? What is happening? And that's what it is. So each teacher, through the evolution of martial arts, interprets those bunkai, those hidden movements, in a different manner. A lot of them are manipulations. I have a student, uh, Alex Stevens, who's working on just mean uh, manipulation goddess, a bone breaking like luar or wrist techniques, mm. arm bars, chokes, uh, sweeps, leg locks. That because the interest in martial art has gone towards the the grappling and towards the jujitsu mm-hmm. from the Gracie brothers, so that's all still part of that evolution of that growth in the martial arts. I mean, years ago, karate school didn't have any ground techniques. Almost every karate school has ground techniques now. So it's all it's all American, okay? It's not. You can't say, "Well, I teach one hakundo." Well, I teach this and I teach that. That's fine. But call it what it is. It's an American system of study from all the volumes of material that we have to go to go get in every style. I mean, so, when you sit down and do a book report on how a butterfly metamorphosis happens, you're going to study 30 or 40 different books and get the gist of what's happening. And that's what martial artists do. I have some students here. Uh, in Oregon that have their own systems of study now. And I've been watching them for 30 years. I was at their, like, say, a white belt, yellow belt test 30 years ago. They're putting together their own material from the study of of all forms of art. And believe you me, there's a a lot of beautiful artists out there that are young bucks in their 30s, 40s, and 50s that are putting together material, it's just awesome. Mm. It's as good as any master from China or Japan or Okinawa or Asia or mm. Thailand. Or I mean, I travel to, to uh, uh, I want, you know, I like studying art, yeah. especially martial art. So I don't know if you've ever heard of this, uh, uh, the, the art of Bogotá. No. Have you never heard of it? No. Well, see, there you go. Tell me more. Okay, Bogotar, uh, Bogotar is a is a warrior, and they they're from Cambodia. Okay, all right. Uh, they were around during the Angar Wat, okay. which is a ten square mile temple that they found, you know, in the early nineteen hundreds. And there are uh, uh, drawings on these temples of these fighters. Mm-hmm. They were Bogotá warriors. And how did they fight in them days? They had elephants and the princes would stand on top of the elephants, right? And, the, and, and they would be in there with all their regalia. 
Uh, and the only way you could get to them was to kill the elephant and let them fall off the elephant and you could kill them, right? Mm. Well, the Bogotar warriors protected the legs of the elephants. That was their job. And when one Bogotar warrior died or got speared or cut or sabered or whatever, another one went right in front of his place. Behind the elephant was a tribe of Bogotar warriors. And I wanted to, I wanted to learn about that art. So my wife uh, helped fund myself and some other people. And we went to, uh, I went to, uh, to uh, Cambodia. Okay. And you can look it up on Google, uh, when two masters meet, look it up, you'll see it. Okay. It's a small, uh, we were gonna make a documentary of it, but we couldn't get the rest of the funding. But it's a good eight minutes. It's all filmed well. Um, and those warriors are still exist over there. When the Khmer Rouge came over there, of course, they, they killed millions of people and, yeah. and they ended all their educational processes. Anybody that could read, they just shot them or whatever. And they, they, they uh, you know, emasculated the whole, the whole country, made them farmers. Well, there are a few people who kept the arts alive over there. And I went to those villages, uh, it's been five or six years ago. And I slept in the little huts with the Bogotar warriors and met some of them. And they, uh, uh, there's a teacher over there. His name is Kim Sun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met him and we did this little clip called When Two Masters Meet. So that material, that, that ancient art of Bogotar is a precursor to the Muay Thai. That's, I was wondering if it, if it, Mimic. Yeah, okay. it was. That's where the 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 uh, uh, Asian uh, Muay Thai and some Chinese boxing came from. That okay. So it's all a big basket, and inside that basket is knowledge. Mm -hmm. And when you jump in that basket, you better be prepared to not be close-minded. Mm -hmm. You better be prepared to have your open mind the way and learn whatever you can because it's all good. So when you went over there, you know, it sounds like you spent a, more than a little bit of time. Yeah. Did you learn anything that you took back and, and replaced something or added well, on to? I learned to a lot about elbows and okay. knee strikes and, uh, and inside blocking and outside blocking. I learned a lot about how to cover. Uh, and it was, it was a gorgeous experience. Hmm. They learned from me because I took some weapons over there, like the Manrique Gusari and the mm -hmm. Sai and, they hadn't seen that. So we shared information, which was good. Yeah, I would imagine their traditional weapons didn't involve any metal. Oh, yeah, on the timing. Some, some steel, yeah. Really? Oh, okay. Saber-like like, saber swords. Okay. Uh, uh, and they used guards. Uh, uh, they have bamboo. And at the end of the bamboo, uh, they have spears that they shaved on the bamboo. Mm -hmm. So when they could punch, they punched with spears because it was strapped to their arm with bamboo. Cool. There's all kind of all their legs have padding so they can't be hit while guarding the elephant's feet. They wear a certain regalia of their own. Mm -hmm. was, look it up, Bogotar. Well, I, I will have You'll to check enjoy it, out. it. Interesting. You'll enjoy it. I'm going to guess that wasn't the first time you <clears throat> made an immersion. You know, as, as you're talking about grabbing all these instructors and doing all these things, was there, well, because you were, you were, I don't know if competitive focused is, is the right way to describe it, but competition was important to you for at least a period of time. And from what I understand of competition in that era, from talking to others on this show, there was a desire to find things that others were not doing so you could have a competitive advantage. Correct. Where were you digging that stuff up? Did you, and, and, and this isn't, uh, um, a great question because I don't have the context to, to ask the question specifically, but it's a an inkling that you were hunting down stuff decades ago, similar in a similar way that you're you learned about Bogota warriors. Okay, so the, your question really is uh, techniques involved with competition. Yeah, the involvement of those techniques. That's really what you're saying. I think so. Uh, well, okay, let's go with uh, individuals in the martial arts during a uh, formative uh, com competitive time era. Okay. Uh, let's go with uh, Chuck Norris, sure. since he's very famous, you know. Um, 
he did a spinning back kick in the early 60s that everybody was just in gaw about. No one could throw a spinning back kick as good as Joe did. I mean, as good as uh, as Chuck did. Mm -hmm. So that became his his trademark, his, you know, his piece of the pie. Okay. Uh, let's go with uh, um, uh, Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis is a great fighter. I mm -hmm. fought him twice. So I know his abilities, right? Well, Joe was quick off the gun. He, he, he did a, a back fist, a six taken. And his back fist was the fastest of most any competitor in the, in the world. And uh, uh, so his, that was his kind of his trademark was the back fist. Okay. And uh, let's go with Mike Stone. Mike Stone had a round kick that they said was devastating. It was impossible to, to, to block. Um, Bill Wallace had what they call a flip kick or a for, forward leg round kick that was mm -hmm. still the fastest of all the planet, right? So competitors in them days didn't just work on all the material. They had to, but they isolated their training to work what's best for them. Sure. Okay. And that transcended in the sport. I had what they called a reverse punch that was dynamite. Mm. Uh, and then a rear leg round kicks, which they say you couldn't really see it, but you could. Um, uh, but I fought people like, uh, let's see, to do a list would be crazy. Um, Ron Marchini, mm. John Natividad, uh, uh, Alex Plus One from New York. Uh, Ken Knudsen. These are old fighters. These are guys that were right in the right in the very front row of the early sixties and yeah. uh, late sixties and seventies. Um, oh, well, I fought Joe in, in L.A. at Chuck Norris's first pro ams. I fought him again in Pennsylvania. I fought Joe Corley in Atlanta, and I beat him too. I only in lost Atlanta. Six. I only lost. I only lost six matches total in sport karate. That's it. Wow. Okay. No, uh, when I, when I played, I won. I was Pennsylvania state champion, North Carolina state champion, uh, California state champion, Oregon state champion, Washington state champion, national champion, top ten rated fighter in the world. I mean, I was good at the competitive part of it because I wanted to do that. I wanted to learn these specific techniques from these guys we had just worked out with that were not famous yet sure and uh and that's what i think the youth wants too today they want some com competition they want to fulfill that that uh, need to compete and feel uh disciplined and do all the aesthetic qualities of martial art mm -hmm. they really want that and a lot of schools are giving that out now of course there's a lot of charlatans out there too but mm -hmm. but uh but uh i really believe that it's the sport of karate pushed forward the techniques pushed forward the the uh, uh, the growth uh, of martial art uh, style. Conscious people kind of went out during the, the late seventies. In the eighties, it was almost gone. In the nineties, it was all conglomerated. Mm -hmm. Even today, uh, you've got these people that want to go to the Olympics. They got to be a member of the WKF. Well, I don't believe in that. I don't think that's right. Uh, the problem we've had with making it universal is that no, they don't get together. All the systems still don't get together. We've been fighting that for for sixty years in America. Do you, you think know, that's inevitable? Can that change? Yeah, no, there's no police in our industry. Mm -hmm. Zero police. You could go to uh, West Covina College and take a karate course and train there for the three years you were there. Open a school down the street and call it whatever you want. There's mm -hmm. no police. So consequently, that uh, that throws a lot of monkeys in the ranch. I mean, a lot of wrenches into the monkey ranch. Yeah. So anyway, that's the way I feel about the sport. The sport was a beautiful and still is a beautiful art. We have a league up here in uh, the Pacific Northwest called Kaizen. Mm -hmm. And that means to move forward with authority, of course. Uh, it's all about the rules. If you play by specific rules, you can get something done. But the rules change in all the different organizations. So, yeah, there's there's no hope. <laughs> <laughs> We're all doomed. <laughs> you know, when 
when people bring up that that subject, this idea that because we don't have a single governing authority across martial arts, you know, there are there are certainly downsides there, but I look at it and I see also a tremendous amount of upside. If there had been some kind of governing body, would they have ever acknowledged what you started doing decades ago with your own style? Would that have been suppressed? And well, so the I governing wonder. Bodies, the governing bodies at that time uh, that that the style came into being uh, was the largest governing body in, in the United States at that time, you know, uh, United States Karate Association by Robert A. Trias. When he sure. passed away, when he passed away, believe you me, uh, excuse my expression, she hit the fan. Yeah. And uh, and I think that when Mr. Parker, the Kip organization, when he passed away, I think that same thing happened. Yeah. Uh, because our forefathers tried to change what came to the United States through the Polynesian, Hawaiian, Asian, Chinese, Okinawan, Korean, because we changed what they brought. It was uh, um, chaotic. But I believe what you just said a few minutes ago, though, and that's uh, that, you know, there's an upside to this. Because the, the qualities that are uh, invested in all martial arts study have weathered the storm. Kind of like the principles of the Bible. They're there. You got to go get them. You got to find them. You got to use them. You got to develop them. But they're there. Hmm. So in the schools that I service, in the schools that I associate myself with, they all have those principles. And as long as those principles are taught within the nature of that dojo or that studio or that gym or that club, whatever they call it, as long as those aesthetic qualities and those principles exist within the nature of their curriculum, I'm happy about it. Because, mm. you are you know, and that's what you're talking about is the upside. Yeah. I mean, you take uh, some of these guys that do MMA and, and UFC and uh, they look, some of them look like fishing lures. They got a piece of jewelry in every orifice of their body. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, there are certain limitations, I think, that, that, uh, that you need to, to live by our criteria. And I think so that the downside is it creates a monster. The upside is it creates great people. Mm. So where is that, where is that line uh, that we, uh, and I think that's within our hearts, you know, and what we think and how we act and what our posture is in, in regards to the, the students and the practitioners of a specific martial art. When I think back to my, my original instructors, I started training when I was really young in, in the early 80s. And some of the earliest conversations that I remember hearing, you know, and this certainly set the tone for who I am as a martial artist now and the fact that this show exists and, and other similar things. I remember a conversation about rank. You know, we would go to competitions and we, this, the dojo I trained in, we were typically slow to promote compared to everybody else. And so it would lead to conversation. Well, wh what is a blue belt? What is a green belt? You know, wh what, it, wh where, where is that standard? And, you know, to their credit, my instructors, I, I, I feel, were decades ahead of their time to say, you can tell, you can look at someone, you can see how they're training, who they are, whether or not they have their belt on. You can look at it. If you've been training a while, you know in seconds what rank that person is. And it took me a long time to kind of walk enough of my own path to come around and see that. And, and what I'm, I'm bringing that up because I'm speculating you know, you're talking about different schools that you oversee training different things in different ways, but that there's something that is universal that you're watching for in each of them. And I suspect that that is along those lines. Can you talk about what it is you're looking at when you look at these? You put a number on it. I forgot what it was. 14? Mm -hmm. 14 schools doing things differently. But there are, there's, there's got to be stuff there that you're looking at and you're saying, this has to be there or, or that 
can't be there. What are those universal elements? Okay, I, one of my uh, uh, members invited me to their school a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I had just come back from back east and running seminars in four different schools. And when I got back the very next week, I had to go uh, teach a class at one of our uh, schools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I asked uh, uh, the teacher, I said, what do you want me to teach? He said, anything you want. So I chose the basics. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, when you go to any martial arts school, uh, whether it be uh, uh, jujitsu on the ground, judo, uh, Aikido, uh, any of the fine arts, any of the hard arts, any of the soft arts. What you look for is the basic movement. And what in football, what did they get? What did they look at? Can you run well? Do you have good balance? Can you catch the ball? Can you throw the ball? Can you block? Can you tackle? Those are the elements that you have to master to be a great football player. Mm -hmm. In karate do, and martial arts studies, you have to be able to block well, punch well, kick well. All your basic stances have to be good foundation. Your hips, your bone structure, all has to be in alignment like the dragon. Mm -hmm. So if you if your elements of basic body dynamic is good, you can go to any art you want and learn. You can go from one to another. But I understand what you say. I, I could watch somebody on the floor for two minutes and know how much time they got on the floor. Okay. How many hours do you have on the floor, sir? Me? Yeah. How many hours do you I, have I, on the floor? I don't know. Many? Okay. That. Is it a thousand? Far more. Okay. Is it 2,000? More? I, I, I've, I've, never, I've never thought about it in this way. So okay. Well, think about it. Is it 10,000? Yeah. Next year is 40 years. So, okay. So, two, three, four thousand, somewhere in that range. Okay. So, they say after you do a technique 10,000 times that you have it in body memory and you will, body will never forget it. Mm. Like, you know, this typing and all that stuff. And it's true. All right. So, how much time each martial artist has on the floor dictates how well and how much he knows in his body, in his mind, and in his spirit. Mm. So you get these guys who go for four years, five years, make their black belt, six years, seven years maybe, and they quit. Okay, and I've had students do this. They come back two, two, uh, maybe five years later, six years later. In one year, they're right back where they were because their body memory their their basics were good in the beginning. Hmm. The worst thing that a person can do is to train people with weak basics. You can see somebody wearing a black belt and they can't even get into a Zen Kutsudachi or they can't even get into a Kibidachi and keep their knees out and their back straight and their hips up. They can't even do it. Their forward knee is, is not bent. Their back leg is not straight. Okay, their mm. shoulders are are tight and they're not they're not relaxed. Okay, so those are the signs of bad martial arts versus good martial arts, and and a, and a person that's trained and can really see it. Okay, so my 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 best thing about that is know your basics. Two and two is four. Four and four is eight. You know, come on, let's get real. And so many don't. They're thrown out there, especially in the competition. Oh, there's, that guy's a good fighter. Did you see him? Did you see how what a kind of strong punch he has on that bag? They put him out there and he gets knocked out because mm. he doesn't have any footwork. You know what I mean? So the point is, basics to me are the key element to all martial art. I agree. I agree. Um, Oftentimes, when people talk about competition today versus competition in the past, yeah, they will point to the addition of protective equipment and perceived differences in 
acceptable level of contact. And some folks who were around then will say, you know, this, this was the better way to go. Some folks will look at now and say, yes, but look how many more people are participating. What are your thoughts on that dichotomy? Wow. That's a whole hour conversation right there. <laughs> I mean, I was there the first time they used the safety equipment, you know. Yeah. Uh, we fought uh, in bare knuckles. Uh, we, we, we had teammate control. Stop when you're supposed to stop with maximum power. You know, uh, very difficult. Uh, that's, uh, to me, more of a purist attitude towards martial art. Uh, that didn't last long in America. It probably lasted until... Mike Stone fought Tajani, Chuck Norris fought uh, Delgado and uh, in Madison Square Garden. And I fought, there was a guy from California. What was his name? He was uh, a bad guy. He had a gold tooth and I knocked it out of his mouth. But, <laughs> um, what did that guy's name? I can't remember. So when they started making more contact without the pads, it, 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 it didn't work. Mm. It doesn't work. Pat Johnson from the uh, from the uh, Karate Kid. He tried. He tried so hard uh, during those formative years of '68, '69. To you know, Mike Stone and Chuck and them developed the Four Seasons, and Mr. Strius was trying to do it in Indiana at the Grand Nationals, and uh, Aaron Banks was trying to do it in New York. It just didn't work. June Ree come up with these pads, safety kick. Hands, safety kick, feet, and pretty soon they had the headgear. Okay, so now you unleashed a bunch of monsters. You got guys like Edward Eddy, Monster Man, right? Ross Scott. They were pounders, man. They just put them gear on, just come forward, just pounding. All the punches didn't look like this anymore. They look like this, right? Mm -hmm. The kicks didn't look like this anymore. They look like that. So... The technique suffered. The quality of movement suffered. The uh, integrity of the movement suffered. Mm. And, uh, but the sport went forward. And then, oh, what happened? Oh, Joe. Joe Lewis. Yeah. He started studying some boxing. Oh, yeah. Jeff Smith. I, 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 I wrote Jeff Smith a check one day for $10,000 in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina at the Park Center. He fought one of my uh, light heavyweights called Keith Aflick for the light heavyweight championship of the world just before the PKA okay. uh, uh, and the, the transition. By the way, I was with Joe Corley in a hotel in, in New York and we wrote the rules for the PKA together in a motel room. <laughs> it's in print, Barbara. It's in print. It's in, it's in print. Uh, so... The, 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 those elements of that sporting aspect at, in the transition from from early days, middle days, 80s, 90s. Now we got bare knuckle stuff going on in the world now, too. We got the UFC to me is uh, is a wonderful. I mean, I like it. I like I, I like it. I don't enjoy a lot of the matches, but I like the concept. Mm. Um, but in sport karate, it's all about the rules. And uh, if, if, if the rules uh, are this, you fight this way. So during that time that you're talking about the transition from one, the pads uh, uh, to uh, full contact, to Joe Lewis, to kickboxing, uh, there was no greater fighter, in my opinion, than this kid that was from California and he fought. Uh, I was uh, the, 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 the color comment, uh, commentator at that in Las Vegas and was who's the boy that was uh was Bill Wallace of course but the guy he fought was uh uh one of the Urakitas family member Rodriguez Blinky Rodriguez mm. that's who it was that was the greatest fight I ever saw what made uh, that I mean oh God, why, was, why that one above everything else because the techniques were still karate and boxing mixed together and they were with technique they were with value. They had uh, uh, fluidity. Uh, the stances were good. Everything was good about that fight. I really thought Blakey beat uh, Bill, but Bill won the fight. But uh, uh, I talked to Red Fox after that 
because he was there. Uh, he said, boy, those guys are great. And I said, you got that right, sir. That was one of the best fights I ever saw in my life. Mm. Like you, Rodriguez and Bill Wallace. Another one was uh, uh, that thrill in Manila. Jeff Smith fought uh, down there. Jeff's one of the greatest uh, kickboxers, martial artists uh, of all time. He really is. Absolutely. That's really a great one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I didn't mind writing that check because it was moving our art forward. It was moving our art forward. We spent about $190,000 on that production. We lost about sixty. <laughs> 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 but that's the sport, you know? Uh, and that, and that's, uh, that's the uh, evolution of it. Yeah. Is it still moving forward? Is the sport side of things still moving forward or has it? Well, there's, there's little leagues all over the country. There's an yeah. ASCA, the ISK, the, the old NBL tried mm-hmm. for so many years. Uh, TCT has it down there in the South right now. We're trying it up here in the, in the Pacific Northwest with Kaizen. Uh, I think it'll be around for a long time, but it will never be united because we've been trying to unite it since 1964. What's holding that back? Ego. <laughs> it's all, it's my answer. I'm right, to everything. You're wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. You know what I mean? That kind mm. of stuff. It's uh, ego, and, uh, and on the rare chances where I think ego <laughs> might not be involved. It's money. Yeah. Well, that's a secondary value of what it is. Uh, you know, uh, I wished I had every dollar I invested in martial art. I wished I did, but mm. I don't. So, you know, I'm comfortable with my five, 15 million. I'm happy, you know. <laughs> A number of the folks who have been on the show from your era have spoken very passionately about history, about knowing history and the importance of understanding where we come from. Do you fall into that camp as well? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I, I know where my bread was buttered. You know what I mean? And I give thanks to that. And I, I, it's clear in my association. I have an association called American Karate Academy's National Association. Mm-hmm. And I say we have 14 members. Uh, and they pay yearly dues. Uh, uh, and they have events that they produce. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're all on the same page most of the time. We didn't allow ourselves to get involved with the the uh, uh, escalation of uh, of um, non productivity in the schools. Mm-hmm. We are productive. Um, we teach the aesthetic qualities in our dojos, and that, that's our priority. So money's not the not the the goal, although money is. Uh, needed to fund everything that you do. Mm. So, uh, you know, I've had 16 karate schools in my life and they all did well. And uh, money-wise, they all did well. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, it's very difficult to to keep the money out of it. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a big one for a lot of people, you know, and they, they, they force their own card uh, in the end, though. And also the ones with the ego, they force their card in the end also. I can't even tell you how many people I know that have tried and failed because they were greedy, because their egos were more important than the arts. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and know, it's, 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 it's ironic. It's a wonderful art. I mean, I can't, I can't complain about uh, well, my, uh, uh, let's see how many years I've been doing this now since I'm 70, I'm 78 now. So what's 12 from 78? 66. So that's how many years I've been kicking and punching. It's a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I just about know most of the older people, few of the younger people, but it's, uh, a lot of the young, young people I don't even know, you know, mm-hmm. don't even know their name. But you name one person from 1960 to 1990, and I'll know them for sure. <laughs> <laughs> When you talk to others from that era, because, you know, I brought up Hunchy Jutnik and you said, you know, yeah. you guys talk. I imagine you talk to others, too. What are you guys talking about? Sure, there's reminiscing. But is there more? Are you talking about what's going on today? 
Okay, have you heard the name Roy Kerbin? Oh, yeah. Nice guy, federal judge, Texas. Huh? I talked to him a few days ago. He's having a celebration I can't go to because I have a family commitment. Mm. But him and I are good friends. You know, James Buten? Mm -mm. Just got three books out right now, all about, two of them about sport karate. Hmm. He's from Texas. How about Pat Burleson? Of course. Okay, well, James Buten just took over all Pat Burleson's thing because Pat just died, you know. Hmm. So James is the inheritor of, 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 of uh, Mr. Burleson. And I just got off the phone with him yesterday, and uh, he wants to go fishing with me in Oregon sometime. Nice. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I talk to my teacher in the Philippines, Mike Stone, quite often, too. So uh, we talk to each other just like I'm talking with you. We're friends, you know. Uh, we've weathered the storm. We beat the battle. We're, uh, we've got our flag up here and we won. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's the most important thing is, were you satisfied? Did you, did you make a difference? Is your legacy going to be around for a while? Mm -hmm. And yes, mine is. And yes, I did. And I'm happy with that. Let's go all the way back. This is a question that usually comes up early in the show, but I, I like when it ends up lingering a bit. Why did you start training? Because I was a weak punk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best answer we've ever had. It's so <laughs> honest. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I needed some, I, I, I needed, I, uh, I come from a large family of six brothers and three sisters. Mm. And I'm in the middle. So I made sure I was, you know, king of the hill pretty quick. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I, 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 I boxed for a little bit too, you know, some golden glove boxing. And, and I, I've always loved contact uh, sports. Mm. So uh, there was just right up my alley. It was a wonderful thing. You know, uh, uh, and it still is. I, if, I, if they had an over the hill gang fight right now where you could go for uh, uh, 30 second rounds, I'd join. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, we aired an episode with Ron Van Cleef. Oh, I just got off the phone with him last week. Did you? Yeah. And, and so when, when you talk about, you know, guys are out there still doing it, you know, he's, he's, a, great doing, example. he's, he's a blue belt now in jujitsu. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. What are you doing, Ron? <laughs> we, we, you know, at, that I was talking to him and then I think it was later that day. I talked to somebody else and you know, I'll, I'll be as vague as I can. So, so I can't go back to which episode and what person that was, but we end up with people on the show who, you know, say, Oh, you know, if I was younger, I'd, I'd try BJJ or oh, nice Miyagi Do mug. I love it. <laughs> you know, if, if, you know, if I was 10 years younger, I'd compete again. And, and you know, then there's Shidoshi Van Cleef. Just, just like, I'm yeah. going to go as hard as I can at, what is he now, 82? Something like that. He's in his 80s. I know that. Yeah. And, yeah. I, you know, I, I still wouldn't want to mix it up with him. I, he would still smash me. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting how a lot, a lot of uh, old timers, how they're turning out right now, too. Uh, people that have uh, been their whole life in martial arts uh, and, and they're doing so well uh, and they're dropping like flies though, because it's their age, you know, our age, uh, the average age for American human male is 74 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got it beat by four right now. So I'm happy, you know? Yeah. Uh, but my friends have been passed. past. We lost Glenn Keeney mm -hmm. uh, in the East uh, just recently. Uh, uh, Pat Burleson was a, a really nice guy. He was the one that won the very first karate competition. You know, yeah. he's uh, he's passed away. Um, it's, they're just dropping like flies. But again, going back to uh, what do we, where who who do we thank? You know, uh, and I, I I have students that thank me all the time. I have women that call me uh, and say thank you. You saved my life. These techniques mm -hmm. saved my life over here. I have parents, grandparents call me and say, without you, my child would not have been doing this, would have been doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so the gratitude and the and the uh, uh, perks you get from making it past 74 are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I have this theory that it's when we we slow down 
that's when we start to die. You know, I've, I've got I've got time. I've got a few decades before I hit that 74 mark. Yeah. But a lot of that theory comes from the time that I've spent with Bill Wallace. You know, it, it does doesn't take more than five minutes out on the floor with him at a, at a Superfoot seminar to recognize there's a man who's just going to keep going. Yeah. And he's still bringing the energy in a way that few of us ever did at any age. I'll tell you a story about Bill Wallace. Want to okay. hear Bill Wallace story? Yes, please. Okay, so there's a guy named King Reed who uh, had a tournament down there in Tennessee. Uh, and Bill was going to the university. He got his degree there for in kinesiology. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I went down there for the tournament, and uh, I fought some guy from Florida, a panhandle in Florida. And uh, he broke my jaw. The referee said, break. I turned around. He grabbed my shoulder. And he was, you know, mm-hmm. fair enough. And uh, uh, I had to go to the hospital. So Bill Wallace took me to the hospital. Bill, good friend. Me. We're good friends. Yeah. Um, and so he, he said, uh, Jerry, the guy, the doc said they want to do surgery on you right now. I said, no, just have them bandage it all up, tie my jaw to my head. And, and I'll, I'll go, when I go back to Richmond, I'll have my own doctor perform the surgery. He said, okay, they got, but they got to give you some drugs. See, the pain is too great. I said, yeah, I know, Bill. And he goes, okay. So Bill took care of me to the hospital, back from the hospital, in the motel room that night, took care of me. Mm. I'm forever grateful that he did that. Good man. And we went to the after party because I had those <laughs> the morphine in me and I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With, with a broken jaw. Yeah. We, uh, you, there you, was you know what? You, they, for, they forget what them. I said before. You guys were a different breed. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I don't I don't think there's an after party after, you know, pick any big martial arts competition these days where, you know, somebody slips, their jaws broken. And they're showing up at the after party. I don't see yeah. that happening today. Yeah, we're a pretty rugged crew, aren't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Bill, Bill, Bill has more stories. I, I got more. I got all kinds. I got a Jeff Smith story. I got a Joe, two of Joe Lewis stories. I got a story on Mike Stone. I got a story on Chuck Norris, too. I got a story on all these guys, man. I, mean, I, mean, I think I'll write a book. <laughs> <laughs> And tell the truth, right? <laughs> I, I would I would love a Joe Lewis story. Um, I spent the weekend with someone who um, trained I'll give you one. under I'll Joe. Give you yeah, one. Please. Okay, so uh, J- Joe was making this movie, some the Tiger something Tigers in L.A. It was uh, pre nineteen seventy, so it was around sixty eight or sixty nine. And uh, he was living in an apartment, and uh, he invited me up there. We we're going to work out and. Uh, he was really fastidious about his appearance. No one hair had to be, you know, in place. He had the best hair. It, 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 it's, it's collar had to be, I mean, one cord couldn't be longer than the other. It had to be exactly yeah. the same length, you know what I mean? So, and he was, his face was immaculate. Mm-hmm. So we, I woke up the first morning and he's in the bathroom and he's, he's putting his face in the sink of hot water. And there's two sinks in this bathroom because it's a Hollywood deal. He said, I want to teach you how to take care of your face, Jerry. So, okay. So he says, do what I do. So we got our faces down in this sink and fix them up. And he's got this, uh, like, felt like sand. You rub it on your, on your skin and, and you, you, you get it all done, you know, and you stick your face back in there. But I wasn't putting my hand in the sand in the little uh, jar. I was just pretending he th- and he was half eyes closed, half he was doing all this, and you know, and I wasn't doing it. And and then in the end, he goes, "You didn't do any of that damn stuff, did you?" And I said, "No, sir, I'm not gonna. I'm not a. I'm not a little girl taking care of my face." <laughs> and that insulted him so bad that I called him a little girl. So my wife and I, this this was many years ago. So my wife and I are at a. They're they're giving me a roast in North Carolina. And Joe was one of the speakers at the roast. And we had a great time at the roast. Uh, Joe Corley, uh, Howard Jackson, a lot of great old, uh, Bob Wall was there. They were roasting me, right? And uh, so the next day, uh, morning, we're in the restaurant of the hotel. My wife and I are sitting at the table. And Joe, you know, he was 
a party or two. So he comes in and his hair looks like an explosion in a mattress factory, right? And he's sitting in the booth with, uh, who's he sitting with? Um, oh, that boy that does uh, the, the karate college, Beasley. So I walked up to Joe and I said, Joe, I said, your hair looks like an explosion in the mattress factory, man. Don't you take care of yourself anymore? <laughs> and the restaurant was full. So I, I always, I always, I was one of those guys who was able to, to tease and joke with Joe, sure. uh, and him get mad as hell at me, but not want to fight. You know, what I mean, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Joe Lewis, one of the greatest, one of the greatest. Yeah. Yep. I'm, sadly, I never met him. You know, most of, most oh, of my didn't. knowledge. Oh yeah, you no. missed out there. That's you missed out there. Who's your favorite martial artist in the past? I've spent the most time with Bill and he's done the most for me. So, got to. Uh huh. Mr. Wallace. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he was really good friends with Glenn Keeney. Yeah. Super good friends. They worked out together there in, uh, in Indiana mm -hmm. for years. They were really good buddies. And they were students of uh, Robert Trias, too. Yeah. Yeah. They had, uh, 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 Mr. Trias would, uh, and they hosted the uh, Grand Nationals there in Anderson, Indiana, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's a there's a name that hasn't come up that I'm 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 curious of because when when we talk about Trias, one of the names that often comes up is Victor Moore. Victor Moore, I know right where he's at. Yeah, I'll tell you a Victor Moore story. Okay. okay. I went to the Battle of Atlanta a few years ago, and I took some students from North Carolina to the Battle of Atlanta. Uh, some of my high rankers went with some of their uh, students from the school and. Mm -hmm. We walked in and I'm walking upstairs and I see Joe over there and I go up and say hi to Joe and everything's good. And I look to my right and here's a picture of Victor Moore on, on, on the wall. Mm -hmm. I looked at that and I went, Victor's here. And then I saw him had a little booth and he was selling pictures of himself, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so he can make money to buy some food so him and his son could eat. Yeah. True story. So I went over to uh, Mr. Corley and I said, Mr. Corley, I said, I'm going to get this guy a room here at the hotel, Victor Moore, because yeah. he's my senior in the USKA. So I'm going to go get him a room and I'm going to get him some passes so him and his boy can have any, all the food they want while they're here. He said, that's really nice of you, Jerry. Victor thanked me a hundred times for that. So he didn't have to sleep in the car. Yeah. Victor's a, Victor is, you know, I mean, he's self-proclaimed a lot. You know, but he's badass. That's Victor Moore is a badass. That that's that is what I Good martial what artist. I heard. Yeah, that is what I heard. Great we had him on. Artist. He was very early, episode twenty or something. Yeah, he, he, he just fallen on hard of, times. That's all. You yeah. know, could happen to anybody. Oh, listen, Victor Moore is in my book. He's a number one, even though in his age, in his age now, he's he's you know not uh, uh, bad times. But it's good. He's he's got a little new association, and he's doing some rank certifications and stuff for some of his people, and he's coming out of it. Yeah, good. You know, Victor. How about Pete Rubino? I don't know that name. You don't know that name? No. Sounds I like can't believe you don't know that name. Look, look. You got a phone on you right now? Yeah. Look up Pete Rubino right now. Pete, Pete Rubino. P e t e yeah. Rubino. R A B I N O Rabino. He was a dance instructor in Newport Beach, California, but he was one of Mr. Trias's first generation black belts. Pete Rubino. He's in charge of all the Coast Show right now. You know Robert Bowles, right? I know that name. Yeah. Okay, well, him and Robert okay. Bowles were direct descendants of uh, the Shurai okay. from Robert Trias. I have to read more about this guy. Cool. Yeah, I mean, he's there, an well, there were a lot of you back then too. Oh, um, there were some great martial artists that uh, that are still alive too. Mm. Uh, uh, what's that get that kid's name? Uh, 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 Ron uh, uh, Martini mm. from California. There is a great martial artist right there, and he he owns a bunch of almond trees in Central California. Uh, uh, so he's just killing it, you know, money wise. But 
I see him every once in a while, but he goes through Bruce's thing gathering in California. Oh yeah. We will sit on the stage and reminisce. Yeah. There's, there's, this, there's a, there's a lot of us left. It's been fun talking to you. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Um, did so I talk one, too much or what? No, no, no. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you for one more thing. Cause I, I like, I like the guests to, to kind of send us off. So, you know, we, we've, we, you've told some great stories. We've threaded things together. We've been in a bunch of different places, but keeping in mind that the audience is almost exclusively martial artists, right. what advice might you give them? If you fall off a horse, get back on it. Never give up. Okay, know yourself and help and serve others. That's my advice. Stay with it. Help somebody else. You know, give, give and give. Because if you give, you're going to get. And never, ever, ever give up your, uh, your, your attitudes and your aesthetic qualities from the martial art. Never. That's my advice. And love your family, of course. Even if you got a son that's pissing you off. <laughs> well, thanks for doing this. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all good. You know, I've, I've been doing karate since dirt. <laughs> <laughs> that should be on a T-shirt. Ha, 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 ha.